Hello, uh, thank you for joining this webcast, which is going to be about Informix auditing and best practices. Um, I do want to let you all know that uh, this webcast is being recorded. Uh, for uh, we'll post it on our site uh, later on. So it is being recorded. Wanted to let you know. Okay, let's uh, go straight into this. And uh, my name is Mike Walker, and I work for Advanced Data Tools. I've been using Formix for about 20 years, and right now I'm heading up our remote DBA support offering. So let's go straight in and form, talk about Informix auditing. All right, so what is it? Well, quite simply, it's um, a method to track certain events that you specify uh, for certain users, or it could be all users. And when those events occur, they're written to a text file. Um, so you can use it to record all sorts of things, you know, who access the database, uh, schema changes, who access certain tables and when, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, the good thing about the Informix auditing is that it's already included. Uh, if you have Informix installed, you already have the Informix auditing feature. Um, and what this presentation will focus on is how to set it up and, uh, and how to use it. Um, and it is very simple to set up, um, really quite easy. There's only a couple of commands, and we'll go through those. Now, what it is not, um, you don't need additional hardware, that kind of thing. Everything is stored locally, but it doesn't provide any automatic alerts for certain things happening. As I said, everything's written to a text file. Um, there are a few things that you need to do, um, some maintenance operations. It does work at the instance level, and you can't audit for a particular database. Um, and it's a little sparse on the details of uh, exactly what changed uh, with each of these events. Yeah, so first of all, there's a configuration file. In the same way as Informix has a, an on-config file to change the um, certain parameters, auditing has the same thing. And uh, if you've got Informix installed, you'll already have this uh, standard configuration file for auditing. It's in Informix the AAO DIR, and the file is ADT CFG. And there's only four values in this file to change. Um, so there's not a lot of configuration. There's actually a, an additional value that's not included in this file, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so I'm going to go through these values right now. We've got um, ADT mode, where you can set, this really says whether auditing is on or off. Um, zero is obviously off. Um, and then the other values, so one uh, starts auditing, and then you can, if you want uh, like your database administrator or your database security officer, which is to do with auditing, to have additional auditing enabled, you can uh, change the value of ADT mode. So you need to ask yourself, when you start auditing, do you want that extra auditing for those privileged accounts? So ADT path, simply where do you want the audit files, these text files that I mentioned, to be stored? And how big do you want them to be? That's in ADT size. Uh, when they get to a certain size, they'll it'll create a new file. ADT Earth says what to do should an error be encountered when it can't write to the audit file. Zero just says carry on. Log a message uh, and it'll trigger the alarm program. Um, but you can use values of one or three if you, if you want uh, a more severe action. So one will stop the thread that is uh, triggering the audited, audible, auditable event. Um, and we'll suspend it. Uh, and three will actually shut down uh, Informix. So zero is the easiest, but if you do use zero, you need to be aware that some events may not be audited. The item that is not included in the configuration file is ADT rows, and that's to do with row level auditing. Uh, with zero, all the events, um, insert, update, delete, uh, that you've got set in as an audit flag will be audited. Whereas if you set it to one or two, you can be more selective as to those which tables um, are audited 
with events like deletes, inserts, updates, and even reads. The on audit command is one of the two commands that are used to, to establish auditing uh, within Formix. Uh, these are the options, and we'll, we'll go through these. So to enable auditing, you can use on audit to set the, set the values dynamically, or you can change that configuration file and restart the engine. So in this example, I'm just using on audit to set those values that are in that configuration, and they take effect, take effect right away. So on audit minus P allows you to set the path of where you want the auditing text files to be stored. So here we're storing them in logs, audit files. So something to be aware of is the location that you're specifying needs to have plenty of disk space. Once you enable auditing, you may be creating some large files um, and you may need a lot of storage depending on the events that you're actually auditing. So here we're setting the size of the audit files. So here we set them to two meg. And finally, we enable auditing with on audit minus L, where we supply a value of one. So that simply turns on auditing. We can use on audit minus C to show us uh, the current values um, used by the auditing. Um, so these, you can see ADT path has been updated and ADT size, ADT size has been updated. Um, and with ADT mode set to a non-zero value, we're now auditing. As soon as auditing is enabled, we'll see a new virtual processor start up. That's the ADT virtual processor. And also a message will be written to the Informix log file. Because we used on audit to modify the auditing configuration settings, um, it creates a copy of the ADT CFG file um, and uh, appends the server num uh, after it. So you can see here we now have an ADT CFG.0 where zero is the server num of the instance. Now, even though we've turned on auditing, nothing will be audited by default. We need to go and tell Informix what events we want to report on, um, what events we want to track, and for which users. And the audit events are a four character code, um, and there's one for each of the events we, we might want to track. I've got some examples here. We've got OPDB, open database, CRTB, create table, and GRDB, grant database access. You can see like CR is usually used for create something, DR is for drop. Um, now there's a long list, as I've supplied a link here um, to all these events, and I can bring that up. So the event codes are listed on the left here, the four character uh, code and the name of the event, and then the variable contents. Each event code has a different, uh, different values that it tracks uh, to do with that event. So there's a long list here. I'm not gonna go through them all, but uh, <laughs> you can get the idea. Okay, so once you've identified what events you want to track, you need to create an audit mask. So the mask is where you put the events into, uh, you associate them with a user. Um, there are some built-in mask names. We've got underscore default, underscore require, and underscore exclude. Now they're built in, they're, they're just uh, like special names, um, but they are supplied empty. And they're applied in this, this order. So if there's an audit mask set up for an individual user, that will be applied first.
always have a default or a require mask. So you make sure that you are auditing new users. Let's say you've added a new user to the system, but you haven't created a mask for that user. They will automatically take on the default or the require mask. So how to add an audit mask? Here we use on audit minus A, so A for add. Okay, sorry, the audio dropped out there for a second. So um, on audit minus A adds a new mask. Um, and here's an example. We use on audit dash A and then dash U for the username. And here I'm using the require mask and then the events. And we, you, we list them with a comma, it's comma separated. And the plus means we want to add them instead of taking them away, which is used for the modify. So as an example, um, once we've created that require, required mask, we're tracking two events, open database and grant database access. So as user Jack, we're going to create and drop a table. So we're going to run this, this simple SQL here and then um, check to see what gets created in the audit file. So the audit file will be created in the directory that we specified, and it will be the, have the host name followed by the, um, a sequential number starting at zero, the first file. And this is the contents of, of that file. And we only see one event because uh, even though we've got auditing on, we've, our mask only has two events in them, and only one of those was actually triggered. Uh, we didn't grant any database accesses, but the open database is there. Um, so the create table and the drop table were not included because they weren't in the mask. So it's very important to make sure that you are including all of the events that you do want to audit. So let's take a look at this file. So as you can see, it's all pipe delimited. The first set of fields um, begin with ONLN, followed by the date and time that uh, the event happened, followed by the host name, the process ID, so in this case it was a DB access session, uh, the database server name, um, the username that triggered the event, and then the last field is colon uh, delimited. So we start with an error code, the event, and then some fields. And those fields depend on the, the event that is being recorded. Something to remember is that the host, uh, the username that is tracked will be the name of the user that is connected to the database. If you've got uh, generic IDs used for an app server or a web server, you will not know who actually made the change. You will just see uh, that generic ID shown in the audit file. Let's look at the last field in more detail. So the rest is standard, but these ones vary depending on the, the event. We always start with an error code. Um, so if the event failed, we'll see it here. A zero shows success. Then we have the event code, the four characters. Here's our open database. And then the fields that follow, in this case, for an open database, it tracks the database name, uh, whether the database was open exclusively or not, um, and the password. Here we're going to create another mask, this time for a specific user, Jill. Again, we use on audit dash A and specify the username. And here we're going to say, let's track a couple more events. We're going to track create table and drop table. Because the require events are, are applied to everybody, then Jill not only will be tracking create table and drop table, but will also get the grant uh, database access and open database events because they're inherited 
from the require uh, mask. So under, as user Jill, we're going to do a few operations. We're going to create a table, insert into that table, and then drop it, and then see what's in our audit file. So now we see some additional events. Uh, so as we expect, we've got the open database, the create table, and the drop table. What we don't see is the insert, because that was not an event that we're tracking. Now let's look uh, closer at the create table event. As I said, the audit, the values that are recorded in this file are, do depend on the event. Um, so for a create table, we, we see a little, something a little different from the open database. We see the database name, a table ID, table name, the owner, uh, a flag that indicates whether it's fragmented, and the last value there is um, the, the DB space that it was created in. Now, while this makes sense, it does create a bit of a complication. If we want to report on this, um, we now need to introduce logic to say, okay, the event was this, that means I am interested in uh, these subfields, uh, you know, table name and username or table owner, whatever. Um, so uh, that does create a little bit of a complication there. So you can also modify an existing mask with the on audit minus M. So uh, here we're changing Jill's audit mask and we're adding the insert row uh, event and we're, we're removing the drop table. Uh, we specify the minus before the DRTB. To show the audit mask that already set up, use on audit dash O, and that will show you um, all the events and masks. You can also use uh, on audit to copy a an, an existing mask and then make changes to it. So here we're using dash R and supply it a, a base mask. So here we're creating a, a mask for Jack based on Jill's mask, but with a couple of changes. Here we're adding the events for delete row and update row. And you can see they're included here. So we've got the create table and the insert row plus the two that are added. And they're always shown in alphabetical order, not the order in which they were added. So you can use the base mask function uh, to create templates. Um, here I've got a couple of examples uh, for a read-only user and a, a read-write user. And you can, when you add a new user, you can say, all right, add the mask for this user based off the appropriate template. You can remove existing masks with the on audit dash D. Here we're removing the mask for Jill. So the audit masks, you may end up with a lot of them, and some of them may, may involve many events. You can use on audit to pull in the audit events from a file. So here I'm changing the require mask, and I'm adding almost every event uh, that we can add, uh, except for read row. Um, so we create a file, or in this file, event list all. I added them all here, comma separated. And the first couple of fields are the mask name, and then a base mask if there is one, and then all the events. If you're loading from a file, it does require that you drop or delete the mask if it exists already. So here it does. So we delete that mask, and then we create a new one based uh, off the file. So when we then list, uh, the audit masks, we see a lot of stuff there because we're tracking all the events. So let's uh, work through an example here. Um, got some SQL where we're going to create it, uh, try and access a database that doesn't exist. Um, we're then going to create a table, insert some rows, update, delete, and then finally drop. Uh, the delete here uh, will delete three rows. It's one statement. They'll delete three records. 
So here's uh, what the audit file looks like. So the first event was the open database. And here we see an error code. Uh, 329, which is database doesn't exist. Here we created the table in a particular DB space, and we can see now that last field in the CRTB event is not blank, but shows the DB space. In the insert rows, we see the row IDs included. And for the deletes, even though it is one SQL statement, because it deleted three rows, we have three entries in our audit file. And you'll see throughout all of these examples, even though we're tracking the events, we don't see anything about the actual changes. We don't see the record that was inserted. We don't see what changes were made through the updates or any of the SQL that was run. So a limitation here is that when you see records updated and then perhaps deleted, you don't know which record was actually updated because all you have is the row ID. It's the same if you create a table and uh, then make changes to it. You need to, the alter table event is limited as to the table name, which just shows a tab ID. So a big part of setting up auditing is determining what events you really want to track and who you want to track them for. So it's tempting to add all the events in there, but then you may just be tracking just way too much. Um, the files will become large, you'll use up a, a lot of your file system, and it may just become unmanageable. But if you're missing certain events, then that might mean your auditing is not very effective because you will not be able to answer questions on who did what and when. Uh, the other gotcha is that the audit events can change between the Informix versions. If you do an upgrade, you need to review what the new events are and then uh, make a decision whether you want to include those in your auditing. Okay, as I said, adding too many events can create problems. And one of the issues is that if you want to audit uh, perhaps all the rows that are removed or added to a table or updated, even all the rows that are selected. If you're doing that across your whole database, even your whole instance, that's going to create a, a lot of entries in your audit file. And it, it, you may only be interested in a subset of tables. Um, you know, perhaps ones that contain like payroll information or financial information, banking info, um, but you don't care about many of the other tables. Because you create the events for a user and not a table, um, Informix auditing allows a row level auditing where you can specify that the events for deleting a row, inserting a row, reading a row, and updating a row are only recorded for tables that you choose. So you can set row level auditing by changing ADT rows in the configuration or using onaudit capital R. So zero uh, is the default. That uh, means we're going to record inserts, updates, deletes for all tables if we have those events listed in the mask. If we change it to one or two, then we will not record those events for, for any tables that have not been set up with auditing. So my example here, I'm changing the uh, row level auditing to two. Now I'm gonna do an example. So we're going to the database, creating a table, creating another table, and now we're using the uh, keywords with audit. That means we're going to start tracking row level events for tab two, but not tab one. If you've got an existing table, you can use the, an alter and just specify add audit. And to remove auditing from a table, drop audit. So uh, continuing with this example, we're making some changes to tab one. We're granting 
um, an insert permission, um, then we're inserting into it and then making some other changes to tab two. So remember, tab one is, is not being set to audit row level event, but tab two has. When we look at the, the file, we see that there's a grant table against that tab one, but we don't see the insert against tab one. But we do see those events for tab two, because tab two, uh, we'd set auditing. So we see the insert row, update row, and delete row. Now, row level auditing, if you start going that way, down that path, uh, you may end up with gaps. You need to be very careful as to what tables you want to track. And especially if you go ahead and create new tables or change the role of a table. Um, so you, maybe you've added a column now that is uh, financial information. You need to consider whether you want to start auditing that new table or that modified table. So the with audit uh, keyword uh, will not be included in a DB schema or a DB export unless you use the minus SS option, just like the extent and row level locking or page level locking um, syntax. So I did find out that if you alter a table the, that has auditing set, then the auditing goes away. So in this example, we're auditing tab two, but following the alter where we're adding a column, um, we did not record a subsequent um, row level operations to that table. And this is most likely a bug. Um, what we need to do is when we alter that table, we've got to add the auditing back in. So a recommendation is that you should regularly be checking what tables you have auditing set and make sure it's still there and issue a warning or send yourself an email or something if some of those critical tables no longer have auditing set. So I did find this uh, SQL will show you what tables have auditing enabled. So you can use that as the basis of a, of a report to run um, just to make sure that those tables do have auditing set if you're using row level auditing. All right, so that's the audit mask and audit events. Let's take a closer look at the audit files. Um, they are stored in the directory that you specify in the configuration and um, they're named with the Informix server name and then a uh, sequential number at the end. When the file gets to the size that we specified, and we use using two meg in our, in our uh, examples, um, it will create a new file. And the, the number will be incremented by one. Also, if you restart Informix, you'll get a new file then too. Or you can force it at any time. Perhaps you want to archive old files. You might just want to switch to a new files file and that file number and then remove, uh, zip up, whatever you want to do with the, the previous files. So here's an example of using on audit dash n. When we do switch to the next file, a message is written to the Informix log. And here we can see how the files have uh, sequential numbers at the end uh, as they've been switched. So now we've got multiple audit files we've got to think, what are we going to do with these things? Because they're just going to start building up. So you need to figure out what is your strategy for dealing with these files? Do you really plan to keep auditing information indefinitely? Um, or do you want to, like, after a certain time, just decide to archive those files or even just remove them? So uh, you do need to think about how to manage those files, because they will fill up the, the file system. So how to find the number of the current file? Um, it is stored in the ADT log uh, dot server num file in the AAO dir under Informix dir. Um, you can just look at that file and see the current number. Or if you run on audit dash C, which shows you those uh, all the configuration information, you'll see the current audit file listed there. Now, on show audit is the other command to do with Informix auditing. 
use this to display the contents of those audit files uh, without looking at the file themselves. In the example, I've just been catting the file, but um, use onshow audit just to, to list the contents. And it gives you some additional uh, options. Um, it will not just show you the last file. It will list the contents of all the files if you, if you don't use it without, um, uh, without specifying a file name. So all the files it has with all those different sequential numbers, uh, if they're available, it will dump out the contents. So I did find that um, when you just run on show audit, it goes to that standard ADT CFG file to find the location of the audit files. Um, so if you've been, if you haven't changed that file and left it uh, as the default, um, and then went ahead and created a, a, a new ADT path um, with on audit as, as I did, um, you'll get this error if you just run on show audit where it complains that the directory doesn't exist. Um, you can get around that by specifying the dash F to, to choose a particular file or dash N where you supply the server number and then it will find the, the configuration file for that, the specified server. So here's the options to onshow audit. And then, so minus F allows you to uh, choose a particular file name and just show the contents of that. Minus N with the server number um, will display the contents of the audit files for that specified server. Um, and you would normally use that if you haven't modified that configuration file. And then you can uh, apply other filters to it by specifying a particular user or a server name. The minus L option on onshow audit is nice. It changes the, um, the delimiters, those colon delimiters of that last field, which shows all the variable information to do with the event to pipes. Um, and then you can supply a file name if you want and then it will unload the, the contents of onshow or the results of onshow audit to, a, to your specified file. Now, if you do that, it might make it easier to parse and then you can perhaps load it into the database or another database or some other tool. But is that really what you wanna do? You gotta, if you start loading the audit data into a table, you gotta start thinking about security and file size uh, or table size and whether you need to start purging records and whether you've opened up things to other users. Um, but it, it, it is a possibility and it, it would make it easier to report on which you can just then do with uh, queries. So some examples. So on show audit um, is listing, lists out the, the contents here for server zero and for, and puts it in a, in a file or sorry, reads it from this particular file, dot one. By specifying the minus L option, we now see we have pipes for all of the variable fields, and it's now a consistent number of values. It also removes the blank lines that you otherwise see uh, between each entry. Okay, so what do you wanna do with this order information? So you gotta ask yourself why do you really want to audit? So are you just trying to track what people did? Are you looking for um, accesses to tables that people shouldn't be getting to? Um, do you want to find out who changed a particular record or modified a schema? So we're talking about dumping out all this data or recording all this data, but now what are you going to do with it? If you're interested in perhaps people accessing tables they shouldn't be or making schema changes, you may wanna parse the, the audit files and actually send yourself uh, an email or a text or something that, that tells you, hey, uh, you know, this morning at 11 o'clock, uh, this user tried, uh, modified the schema of this table because um, they may not have been, uh, had permission to do that. So that's something that, that I like to do. 
I've got an example of a of a, an email that shows me all the people that created uh, uh, any tables or dropped tables, and you can do that for each event. It is a kind of manual because the events or the information um, that you want to report on does vary depending on the event. Okay, so that's enough of the, the slides for now. Uh, I do have a, a little bit more to cover, but I wanted to launch into a demonstration uh, of auditing. So here's an Informix. Uh, I'm connected to um, a Unix server here uh, where I've got auditing, or I'm about to set up auditing. Okay, so before I start, I'm going to show you the, the default configuration file, informix.aao.de. And it's just got these two files in it, ADTCFG and ADTCFG standard. They're very similar. Um, but let's just look at this one first, the ADTCFG. So this is, these are the default values showing auditing is not enabled. Um, and the path of the audit files, size. So I'm going to change these values now because I'm going to turn on auditing. The first thing I'm going to do is change the path where I want my audit files to go. And I've already got this directory created. I'm just showing the directory is there and it is empty. I'm going to change the, the size of each audit file, the maximum size, before it switches to a new one. And finally, I'm going to turn on auditing. So to make sure the changes are there, on audit-c shows the, the current configuration. So I can see auditing is enabled. Let's go into this path, and here's the size. Looking at the end of the Informix log, I'll see the audit mode was changed to one, and an ADT virtual processor was uh, started, which we can see here. We have uh, an ADT virtual processor. So to start with, there are no masks set up. And on audit dash O shows the masks. The dash Y just says don't prompt. If we if we remove that, it says are you sure? Yes. So we can just skip that with the dash Y. So I'm going to create a couple of masks here. So I'm going to add a new mask. The username in this case is going to be one of those reserved uh, mask names. Require, and the events I want to track are OPDB, open database, and closed database. I'm going to take a look at the values or the master setup. I see it was created successfully. And create another mask, this time for a particular user. User in this case is Jill. And we're going to add the, or we want to track the events, create table, and drop table. Let's take a look. There's the two masks. So remember that the require will be inherited, the events there will be inherited into the other um, masks. So we're actually tracking four events for Jill and then just the two events, the closed database and the open database for um, all the other users. So as I'm under user Jack this time. So as user Jack, I'm going to run some simple SQL. I'm going to create and drop a table. Pretty exciting. There's the table and there's the drop. Now let's look at what we managed to track here. So, 
go to logs. In the audit files directory, I've now got a file, which is the text file where these events were captured. So the last two events are, are what I was tracking. There's the open database and the closed database. There's the database name, stores demo. Um, now I don't see any operations for creating a table or dropping a table because those events are not listed in the require mask. You may be wondering what these other events are. So when you um, run on audit, uh, entries are put into some of the system tables. And so the very act of running on audit will itself create auditable events. And that's what those are. Okay, so now I'm going to go in as user Jill and do some similar SQL. So here we created the table, dropped the table, but we also did an insert. Let's look back at this file. We now see entries for Jill. Um, and now we're seeing the create table and the drop table events recorded. We don't see the insert because, again, that's not uh, uh, an audit mask. So instead of just catting the file, we can also use onshow audit is the preferred way to do this. And remember I said, if you don't supply a server name, because the values are coming from the default configuration file, we'll get this error. Let's supply minus N. And this shows all the values, or all the audit events. Now, I can run the same thing with dash L we see it without the blank lines, and um, it's changed all of the colons in the last field to pipes and made the same number of pipes so we could load that into uh, a database or another tool if we wanted. So I'm going back in as user Jill now. Um, You know, let's, let's show you when we when we switch files. So we have this Griffin.0 is the first file. Um, we can switch to the next file with on audit dash n. Says next file. Let's do it a couple of times, and we see how we've got multiple files created. On audit dash c show the configuration, we see the current audit file is two. Okay, let's um, show a demonstration of the uh, row level auditing. So first thing I'm going to do is modify the, the mask, the require mask, and we're going to add some additional events. Insert row, delete row, and update row. You'll see we've got all those in there. And we're going to turn on the row level auditing. So now we've got ADT rows set to one. So as Use a Jill. I'm going to do a couple of things here. Okay, I've created some tables um, where uh, tab one doesn't have auditing set, tab two does. Now we're going to run some operations on those tables.
So we're inserting into table one, we're updating table one, we're deleting from table one. Then we're doing the same SQL, the same operations, the insert, the update, the delete on table two. Let's take a look at what we've got in our audit files. I'm going to use um, on show audit dash L and I'm going to say, let's just see what user Jill is doing or has been doing. So we can see here's the the, the process ID. So the last uh, five operations um, would, would be that last uh, DB access session, I ran, access session that I ran. And we can see that Jill opened the database, stores demo, inserted a row, updated a row, and deleted a row, and then closed the database. Now, you can see here we don't see the table name. What we see is the tab ID. So we need to look to see what that table name is. Whoops. Yeah. Let's try and type things correctly. From So it's tab two. So with the these insert updates and delete events not showing the table name but just the tab ID, it creates a complication as to if you were to report on this. And it would be worse if the table was was then was then dropped later on. So something you might want to do is unload table names and tab IDs periodically so you can go back and, and cross reference. Um, that if you are going to report on it. Okay, so that's, that's, um, those are the events there. And uh, what we saw here is that the tab one table did not have those events recorded. Um, we didn't see the insert update or the delete. Now other events against tab one would still be recorded. Um, just as long as they're not inserts, updates, deletes, or reads. Okay, back to the presentation. So role separation. Now, all of the stuff that I've just shown you has been done as the Informix user, uh, which means the Informix user can do pretty much everything. Now, that might be okay in your organization uh, if you, if not many people know the Informix password. If you've got a DBA and that DBA is, uh, is the only one that can make changes and you trust that person to make the auditing changes to, then, then that's okay. But role separation allows you to split off certain uh, operations from, from that user. So here you've got with role separation, you have these three roles. You've got the AAO, the Audit Analysis Officer, and that person is uh, responsible for configuring the auditing, reviewing the audit information, and managing those audit files that are created. That person cannot change any audit masks. Instead, that can only be done by the DBSSO, the Database System Security Officer. Now, that person in turn cannot change any of the auditing, cannot turn auditing off, uh, cannot mess with the auditing files, that kind of thing. Their role is limited to just changing the audit masks. And then you have the DBSA, the Database Server Administrator. Now, the role of that user is often what the Informix user might be used for now, except it is more limited. So I've created a little uh, matrix here of, of the differences. So you can see if you've enabled role separation, the Informix user can't do anything with auditing, can't start it, stop it, change masks, that kind of thing. That can only be done by the AAO. 
and the DBSSO is the only one that can change the audit masks. Now, in terms of uh, access, if you remember, Informix can get to any database. The DBSA, the database server administrator, cannot get to any database, but can only get to databases where they've been granted access. So you can tell this already, it's a little bit more secure there. Um, also, the DBSA can't start messing around with the, uh, the cooked files for the chunks. Um, and by enabling role separation, you are making your system more secure in terms of access, but also uh, limiting the Informix access just for things where Informix is really needed, um, like upgrades and you know, adding chunks and that kind of thing. So how to enable role separation? Um, the role separation is based on the permissions of the Unix groups for different directories. Uh, you can set it up at installation time, or you can set it up after the install. There's a few steps to take, but it can be done. So an example of, of doing this at install time, um, if you go into the custom install, you should get a prompt to say whether you want enable, to enable role separation. If you choose that you want to do that, it asks you for the names of the groups. You can choose anything you want, it just needs to be a, a group within Informix, uh, but the names are up to you. Uh, following the install or enabling role separation, you'll have these certain directories, AAO, DER, DBSS, O, DER, and ETC owned by the appropriate users, or groups, I'm sorry. And if you need to enable role separation after your install, you can go ahead and make those, change those uh, permissions, uh, group permissions on those directories, and also change the permissions for executing on, on in it. And change the permissions on the on config and SQL hosts. So what happens once you've enabled role separation? Well, when you've got that, anytime you try and run an on order or on show order operation that is not permitted by that user, you'll get a warning that you need to be, only one of the other users can do it. For example, as a user in Formix, I'm here, I'm trying to turn off auditing, and I get a warning, no, can't do that. Um, if I want to display the audit information as, uh, as the database security officer, I get a warning. So using role separation really limits uh, those users to that particular role. Okay, so, before you, or if you're thinking of setting up auditing, you need to ask yourself a few questions. Um, as I said, it's easy to set up, but there, there's things you need to do at the outset. So like, where are you gonna put the audit files and do you have the space? What are you gonna do with those audit files? Are you gonna archive them? Are you gonna store them in the database? Particularly, what events do you wanna capture? Um, do you need row level auditing? And is the level of detail that's recorded in the audit file enough uh, for what you want to what you want to do? Uh, remember, SQL isn't recorded, and I've already said that some of the information is a little limited. Do you need role separation? Um, and then, if you're using row level auditing, how are you going to tell that it's still there and somebody hasn't messed around with things? and taking it away, possibly accidentally, by altering a table. And most importantly, wh what are you trying to do with these recorded events? Um, once you've got them, do you want to use them after the fact? Like, oh, I can no longer, or somebody changed the scheme with this table, my applications are failing. Let's go back and review the audit files to see who, who modified it and when. Um, or are you really looking to see for intrusions into certain tables? So the big question is, does Informix auditing solve the problem you're trying to fix? 
Now that's the end of my presentation, uh, but before I go on to questions, uh, I did want to say that this presentation, this webcast has been part of a series we've done. This is the last in the series, um, and we have put recordings uh, and replays, uh, they are available on our website um, if you missed anything. And our next webcast is coming up at the end of August, and that is going to be about running Informix in a monster virtual machine by Lester Knudsen. You can go ahead and register for that now. A couple of resources. Uh, if you're not already part of the International Informix User Group, the IAUG, I would suggest you do. Um, it is free. Um, the Washington Area Informix User Group is a great organization. Uh, there is a meeting coming up at, uh, in just a couple of weeks, uh, August 8th, in McLean. We do have uh, some training coming up in September. We've got two courses. Uh, we've got the Advanced Informix Performance Tuning and then uh, Informix for Database Administrators, which covers um, a lot of the stuff for, for folks new to Informix um, and also those who haven't used it for a while. Um, you can either take the training at our offices in Virginia or take it over WebEx. So it saves on travel. Okay, I'm going to open up to questions now. Um, if you have questions, you should see a chat window um, on the screen. Just go ahead and, uh, and just type in there if you've got any questions. I did want to repeat that uh, this presentation has been recorded and will be posted onto our website over the next few days. And you can always uh, just reach out to me directly uh, at this email. I'm not seeing any questions. I'm going to just leave it open for, for a minute. All right, with no questions, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. I'd like to thank everybody who attended. Um, please reach out to me if you have any questions on auditing. Um, and thank you for attending this webcast. Thank you.